This is the American Law Journal. A million and a half Americans are in nursing homes. Mortality rates are high. Reports of abuse and neglect common. Here comes the showdown this week on the American Law Journal. Elder abuse in long-term health care facilities is called an unchecked epidemic. But astute lawyering and now the U.S. Supreme Court may be changing the legal landscape. ALM's Gina Passarella has this. An aging population, a surge in nursing home residents, low-income employees and understaffing, a combination prime for litigation. The two most common injuries that you see are cases related to, to pressure sores or bed sores, and then the other big category of cases are fall cases. We see a lot of pressure sore cases where people are not being moved enough in their beds. And over the course of years, I've represented a lot of families that have had individuals in nursing facilities and have suffered severe injuries and, and sometimes died as a result of it, uh, including hypothermia and things of that nature, which are really just, it's just awful. Although some long-term care facilities get high marks, there are more reports of severe injury and abuse. I think it's both understaffing, and I think it is poor training, and I think it is a toleration, a tolerance. Um, by management that poor care is being delivered. And any time you give anyone a profit motive to reduce services, to increase somebody's revenue, you are going to lay the foundation for mistakes in poor care. Which can lead to lawsuits, though that may be easier said than done. You do have challenges as a plaintiff's attorney. Oftentimes, People might not want to bring the actions on behalf of the elderly because damages are somewhat limited. There's typically not a lost wage claim or any of those kind of typical traditional economic damages that you would see maybe in a more traditional medical malpractice suit. But some damages are better than none, especially when care is abusive or results in death. However, most nursing home residents and their families sign contracts with arbitration clauses, keeping them and the nursing home out of court. That could change. Last year, the Department of Health and Human Services stopped nursing homes from requiring residents to arbitrate their disputes. And although a federal court just blocked that rule, the U.S. Supreme Court is taking the arbitration issue up again, meaning aggrieved nursing home residents and their loved ones may still get their day in court. The care that we give as a society to our care-dependent people is the mark of a civilized and compassionate people. As the population ages and plaintiff's lawyers continue their outreach, all sides would agree nursing home litigation is likely to increase. The question is, where will that play out, whether it be in the courtroom or in the arbitration setting, and what role the Department of Health and Human Services will play? For the American Law Journal, I'm Gina Passarella. All right, three guests with me tonight. Let's go ahead and meet them. Chris Culleton is a plaintiff's attorney and founding partner at Philadelphia's Swartz Culleton. He represents individuals in catastrophic injury matters, including senior health care cases. Ingrid Sidorov joins us this evening, program director for long-term care at On Point Legal Nurse Consulting in Villanova, Pennsylvania. And Mike Boudier is corporate defense counsel with Buchanan Ingersoll concentrating on defending long-term health care providers. The complaints about bad nursing care seem to be louder, and some of the statistics are also very daunting. Does this really come down to understaffing or poor staffing? Is I think, that, it, Chris, does, I think it does. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we get these calls every day, and every day we're getting calls of the same thing. Bed sores, fall downs, people left unattended. Uh, people not responding to call bells. Why aren't they responding to call bells? Because they've got too much work going on. They so, have too many other things to do. But haven't we always had problems with nursing home care? Oh, I, I mean, I think, we did, I think we did a program about this maybe 20 years ago. Well, there's more people now. There are more people in nursing homes, mm -hmm. and they're also sicker. A lot of the healthier people that used to be in nursing homes are now in assisted living facilities or in the, they're in personal care facilities. The rehab population that's coming out of the hospitals, they're getting thrown out of the hospitals or kicked out of the hospitals sooner, and where they ended up in the nursing homes. So you have sicker people and you have less staff. There's consolidation in the industry. A few big names are taking over. And what are they doing? They're trying to make money. And how do you make money? By cutting corners. Let's get a little balance in here, Mike. Is, is this your view of this situation as well? It, not at all. What you've seen over the last 10 years is actually, it's incredibly rare to see even one day during a nursing home admission where 
a nursing home doesn't have staff according to the state regulations. Moreover, uh, Chris touched on the fact that there's more rehab patients and there's a more increasingly acute population, and nursing homes are rising to meet that challenge. Uh, by way of example, nursing homes now often have in-house nurse practitioners. That was something you never would have seen 10 years ago. You also see rehab departments that, again, have in-house physicians. That's something you never would have seen 10 years ago. So nursing homes are dealing with more complex patients, but they're rising to meet that challenge. But again, according to Penn Live, a third of the nursing homes in your state, they say, are, quote, unquote, dangerously understaffed. Uh, I have a couple of things to say about this. Go ahead, Ingrid. Because I'm a nurse, and I've done some work in long-term care facilities, and I think like any healthcare system, it's more than one issue. It's more than just being understaffed. I think that we have to understand that people that are working in nursing homes are typically underpaid, undervalued, undereducated, um, are, are stressed out. The regulations and regulatory compliance issues are, are uh, a big issue. I think that the federal guidelines are that there be one RN per eight hours in every nursing home and the rest of the time can be covered by an LPN. States vary. Let me what, clarify that, Ingrid. Is that an undue burden then on the facility? Uh, no, I don't think that it's enough. Um, I hear Michael saying that it's very rare in a nursing home to see that there's not enough staffing. I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think that people call out and it's very difficult to get that, that position covered. Um, again, having enough RNs. LPNs, it's the only place for LPNs to work. They don't have any place to go other than to work in nursing homes. They, I know a lot of LPNs that feel somewhat trapped. Um, and again, I think that the, the main crux has to do with the caregiver staff. Um, there's a great deal of turnover in nursing homes, and we all know that with our elders and our loved ones, we want them to be taken care of by people that know them. Look, I mean, Mike concedes there are sicker people in nursing homes, and yet the state minimum has not gone up since 1999. We're still at 2.7. When I take, no, I take, what does 2.7 mean? Well, what that means is that there has to be 2.7 total number of hours for nursing aides, LPNs, and RNs per patient day. So in other words, it has to be 2.7 hours for every patient in a day. That hasn't changed since 1999. I take the depositions of the staff every time there's a case, and I ask them, what is your PPD? Well, the PPDs are 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. I asked the nursing home administrator, can you still be understaffed and have 3.3 PPD? And they say yes. Why? Because of acuity. Acuity is a measure of how sick the population is. And there are reports that you can look in. And we look into these reports, and our experts see them, and they say, wait a minute, you have all these people. You have people on ventilators. You have people who need one-on-one -on -one care. You can't provide that with 2.7 ratios. You need 3.5. And I think Mike will, um, will agree with me that there's a report that came out recently by a very reputable expert in this field, and the number they came up with was 4.1. And that 4.1 number, that's from a really discredited expert? Oh, I disagree with that. And, right. and, the, and that, that 4.1 number is based on an entirely different calculation based on, from what the states use now. So a 3.2 using his calculations would actually be about a 3.8 or a 3.9. So we're really not talking about a big difference. And Chris is talking about therapy patients and ventilator patients. Those patients have therapists. They have respiratory therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists. None of those people are counted in the PPD number. Likewise, you have the nurse practitioners that I told you about before. Again, they're not counted in the PPD number. Yeah, but they're not the people who are going to stop bed sores from occurring. They're not the people who are going to rotate the patient every two hours to offload their pressure points so that they don't get skin breakdown. And there's a lot of other offloading that's going on. When somebody's up getting physical therapy, they're not in bed lying alone like Chris is trying to portray. They're up, they're being moved around, they're getting therapy two, sometimes three times a day, depending on the type of therapy that they need. But as plaintiffs, though, Chris, these are not necessarily as, as bad as an injury may be or as poorly understaffed as a home may be. These are still not easy cases to bring. Well, they're not easy cases because under Pennsylvania law and nearly every state law, it is hard to recover damages for somebody who is near the end of life. Right, so that, um, that's, where, that's your starting point. So if someone is 81, and again, unless there's something that shocks the conscience, uh, the way the law has to value cases is, okay, how much time does this person basically have left? Maybe what is the degree of injury, the degree of negligence, or the lack of care? But still, at the end of the day, when you start computing that up, it doesn't turn into a lot of dollars. And let's face it, plaintiffs are not gonna bring cases unless there's some sort of remuneration there. And that's true. And also you have the issue with the liens. A lot of the time, the money that you recover for, for the family, some of that has to go back to pay the federal government for Medicare and Medicaid. 
But you can make these into cases by not attacking the individual incident. In other words, somebody falls and breaks a hip. You don't look at the nurse that allowed that to happen. You look at the system that was set up that allowed that to occur. So you have to look at the systemic failure. Is that for your jury speech, or is that more along the lines of computing what this case may be worth? Well, that's the only way you're going to generate serious damages, is by looking at the profit motive. Why do these injuries occur? Because of under-resourcing and understaffing. But Mike, you object to that though, right? Uh, absolutely. The reason that Chris needs to bring up these corporate themes and these claims of profit-seeking behavior is because on a lot of the cases, they simply can't prevail on the medicine. It's very hard to prove causation in a nursing home case. It's very hard to find a physician who is going to come in and say some deviation, some mistake by the nursing staff caused an injury. And that's always going to be a hurdle that plaintiffs are going to have a very difficult time overcoming in these cases. Well, I disagree. I don't think it's, it's difficult to prove the malpractice. It's difficult to generate damages just from the malpractice if you treat the case like a malpractice case and you don't treat it like a corporate negligence case. Right, because who's your witness, right? Because we can get evidence from family members, people who visit, who, who will see things. We can get evidence from former, pe former employees. We find CNAs that used to work in nursing homes who will testify about the things that were going on. And often they'll say, look, I couldn't get to all my, my, my patients. I would hear the call bell. I couldn't answer every time because I had six other people to take care of that night. That happens. And Mike, some of the cases you're seeing are not even cases brought by the resident themselves loss of consortium, family members, etc. So now your litigation palette expands exponentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. More often than not, the plaintiff that we see is the family member. Um, sometimes somebody who visited, often sometimes somebody who never stepped foot in a nursing home and never saw their loved one and is really just looking for a payday at the end of the road. Well, um, and also, I, wanna, I do want to address Chris's point about the former CNAs. I've deposed those very same people. And while they'll, you know, former employees, people who've been terminated from their jobs, will come in and disparage their former employers, when you ask them, did you give good care on your shift, they will all, without a doubt, say, yes, I did. People on my shift got good care. No, they'll I, say they did the best they could, given the number of patients they had. Ingrid, who do I go to in the state? Who I, who, do I, is there an ombudsman? Yes, is there, there's an ombudsman, and okay. it's very easy to find that telephone number, and that's the best place to go. But I will tell you again, when it comes to... Uh, people working in, in, in government type jobs, they too are overstressed and overworked and don't always, can't always get there when they need to. Um, you know, I, I think that there are, are nurses out there that are, are called case managers that may be called as well social workers within the nursing home to go to and raise a complaint to. I would go straight to the director of nursing and the nursing home administration if I saw problems going on. There's great guidelines out there about if you go into a nursing home what you want to look for. One of the first things you do is you just go in and you get a feel for does it smell like urine and do the people look happy or are they just sitting around looking bored. Looking for a five-star rating on a nursing home is not the way to find the best nursing home for your loved one. And for plus sure. the, some of those highly rated nursing homes have very long waiting lists, no? Well, and, and maybe again because, you know, I think word of mouth and knowing, uh, you know, there's some nursing homes that I know that are outstanding. There are others that I know that are struggling. I don't blame anybody in those nursing homes working. They are good people. Anybody that's working in geriatrics obviously cares about taking care of older adults. I do have some issues with some of the corporations that own some of these nursing home chains and trickle down there being a lack of gloves or toothbrushes or basic needs and, and housing people in rooms where there's not enough room for their own furniture and not enough recreational therapy and all that other stuff, but um, there are ways to get help. Well, um, a large part of this litigation, of course, winnows down to what kind of contract did the resident or the resident's family sign? Arbitration clauses are common in nursing home contracts, but if we look at what happened with the Health and Human Services last year and now a recent Supreme Court case, the landscape may very well be changing. From nursing home contracts and employment agreements to credit card and cell phone contracts, corporate America uses forced arbitration clauses to restrict Americans' access to justice. In the last decade, on numerous occasions, the Supreme Court has reviewed the constitutionality of arbitration clauses, and almost unanimously they have been upheld. And I think the trend is that these clauses are generally enforceable. We have a society have determined that the elderly are able to enter into contracts just like anybody else. You don't have a right to a jury trial. You're taking a fundamental right away from families, unfortunately. 
the only way that we can assure that our nursing facilities will be as safe as possible is the threat of litigation. And here comes the Supreme Court again, in what could be the latest salvo in the nation's ongoing arbitration wars. At issue in the Kindred Care case is whether someone with power of attorney can bind a nursing home resident to arbitration. And I don't like it when facilities try to shift the burden or evade their obligations by having lay people sign forms. But for me and for my clients, I believe the best opportunity to have a finder of fact and a finder of law evaluate the case in the most objective way it's with a professional judge, and oftentimes that's an arbitrator. So, Mike, it, it's really common to see an arbitration clause in m most of these nursing home contracts, but it seems that the, uh, again, the Department of Health and Human Services, and now the Supreme Court, is looking at the validity of these arbitration clauses. Doesn't that cause you some concern or call, uh, have your clients? Aren't they a bit concerned? Actually, Christopher, in 2012, the U.S. Supreme Court looked specifically at arbitration clauses in the context of nursing home admissions, and they found, without a doubt, unequivocally, those contracts are enforceable. Right. And that, that was a per curiam decision. It wasn't a split 5-4 nail-biter. This was the entirety of the U.S. Supreme True, Court. True, but now that, they're taken, now that they've granted certiorari, uh, the Kentucky Supreme Court said that non-residents should not be bound by arbitration agreements. Chris, I know plaintiff's attorneys are not real fond of arbitration agreements because, again, it relegates you to a single, usually a former judge, to make the decision. Yes, it's cheaper. Yes, you get to a decision more quickly. But at the end of the day, plaintiffs don't do as well under arbitration agreements as they do when they go to court. That is true. And also... I have never had a client come in and tell me that they signed an arbitration agreement willingly and voluntary and that they knew they were signing it. What happens is these people arrive, they're given an admission agreement, they're asked to sign a number of documents. I don't think the nursing homes explain what is in those documents. Maybe they do, maybe they don't understand it. But they certainly don't freely and willingly enter into a contract to give up their right to bring a lawsuit. Ingrid, I don't imagine you have a horse in this race, but this has got to come up in your practice as well, no? No, it has not come up in my practice, actually. But I can tell you, as somebody that's watched people sign those reams of paper, that I wouldn't be surprised if they don't really quite understand what's being signed, especially under the stress of what's going on with getting somebody into a nursing home. I, I see these contracts every day, and one thing that's left out of this discussion here First of all, we as a society have determined that the elderly are able to enter into contracts just like everybody else. And you'll see in many of these cases where somebody has signed an arbitration agreement, where they've agreed, this is the way I want my dispute to be heard because it's going to be faster and more efficient, that they will turn down other options. There are other options in the admissions agreement that they, they say, no, you know what, I don't want this, but I do want arbitration. So to say that they're just checking boxes and saying yes to everything is really not consistent with the reality that we see when I practice and, and seek the enforcement of these on a daily as a, basis. As a nurse, I'm going to say here, because I'm into research and standards of care, I would like to do a research project related to this subject to see how many people really come out af after signing things that, and understand it. I'd just be curious. The arbitration agreements that you find in nursing home admissions are more fair than any other arbitration agreement that you're going to see today. They are loaded with protections for the family. There's well, a 30-day rescission period. They're voluntary agreements. They're not forced agreements. They're not, your admission to the center is not contingent upon signing those agreements. They are voluntary agreements. They are some of the most procedurally fair agreements that you're going to see in any context. Do you agree? Chris, well, Christopher, we've been very successful in defeating these arbitration agreements based on state contract law. So often the person who signed the arbitration agreement didn't have a power of attorney, even though they were signed as power of attorney. One wasn't in the file, one didn't exist. We've also defeated them in wrongful death cases because the arbitration agreement doesn't apply to the wrongful death. Also, we, we, we've had situations where the person who signed them was the patient or the resident, and we've got the resident's medical records to show that the medical uh, that the person was not cognizant of what was going on at the time to be able to contract. Well, one would think, and again, that would be void ab initio, correct? Correct. Let's shift gears here a little bit. CNN recently claimed that there is an epidemic with the elderly being raped in America's nursing homes, and even Penn Live said that uh, sexual abuse of seniors is rampant and has to stop. A week before Christmas in 2014, a nurse at Walker Methodist walked in on an unthinkable act by a 76-year-old certified nursing assistant. Who had his pants down and it was between her legs and he was raping her. 
even though facility records show Sonia Fisher's rapist George Kapingba had been previously suspended as part of at least three other sex assault investigations at the same facility. CNN analyzed data from coast to coast and found from 2013 to 2016 more than a thousand nursing homes have been cited by federal authorities for mishandling suspected cases of sexual abuse. The cases range from allegations of inappropriate touching between residents to violent rape, and at least a quarter involved alleged sex abuse by an employee at the facility. CNN found that many perpetrators face no punishment at all, sometimes even allowed to continue working with the elderly even after multiple allegations of abuse. He took away the last shred of dignity that my mother had. Alarming, no? Doesn't matter if you're plaintiffs or defense counsel. Alarming, but as a practitioner in this area for a decade, I have seen no evidence of this epidemic. I've, I've seen two cases literally in 10 years. Much come across your desk yet, Chris. You know, epidemic, um, I wouldn't call it an epidemic. Uh, we have seen some cases, um, not so much in the nursing home setting, in some other settings. Um, I, I think to call it an epidemic might be a stretch. Okay, so just because a major news agency runs uh, a news report on it, although some of the numbers are very compelling. And then, Ingrid, again, I don't know if you saw this or not, but that Snapchat uh, issue where uh, ProPublica identified 35 instances since 2012 where workers at nursing homes and assisted living centers were surreptitiously photographed or videotaped, some of whom were partially or completely naked. That shocks the conscience, doesn't it? I, I think it does, and I, I think, you know, the, the reports don't really have that hard and fast data. This is a very hard thing to track and know exactly what's going on. I have no doubt that it is going on. I think part of what's going on is that when you have residents who have dementia, especially certain types of dementia, which make you a little bit more sexually promiscuous, um, this kind of behavior may happen. Um, I think it's, you know, egregious to think about somebody in a nursing home who's an employee that's, that's doing things like this. I don't know whether it's an epidemic or not. I, it does sound a little sensational to me. I think it's a problem. I think we don't know how big it is. I think that we need to explore it more and, and get some hard and fast data and, and figure out ways to get a handle on it and do things about it. Again, you're dealing with people working in nursing homes who are undervalued, underpaid, overworked, you know, and, and, and bad things happen when those, when those ducks are in a row. Here's just a, a little bit of advice uh, for some people who may have a mother or father entering a nursing home. First, get to know the staff. Also, point number two, be reasonable. Don't go nuclear right away. Uh, contract an area agency on the ombudsman. Maybe get a geriatric care manager and make regular, if unpredictable, visits. Let me get some response from you first, Ingrid, and I'll get to my attorneys. That's a great list of advice. I mean, that's exactly what I would say to do. I think the closer your loved one is to, in the nursing home in close proximity to a family that can just stop in is a good idea. I think that, you know, the Area Agency on Aging is there to, to help. But again, they may be overworked and overstretched. You may need to reach out to a case manager. But that is the job of the ombudsman. But again, you know, making frequent visits, getting to know the staff, making them understand that you understand that they work hard, too. I mean, one of the ways that litigation doesn't happen is that if staff is good at from the beginning saying, you know, your mom's really sick and she has a bunch of risk factors here for, for developing a pressure ulcer and here's what you can do to help us. You know, I think the families that are involved, uh, it, it, it can make a big difference too in the care of, of, our, of our elders. Gotcha. And, and Chris, how does this intersect with your practice, if at all? Well, here's what I would tell people. When they, uh, when they ask you to leave the room because they're changing your loved one, don't leave the room. I mean, it might be hard to look at it, but you have to stay and be a witness. Because we get this all the time. The families come in and they tell us that the bed sore started in July. We get the records and we find out that really the bed, star, the bed sore began in February, but the staff didn't tell the family what was going on. Um, photographs. Everybody has a phone. Every phone has a camera. Take pictures and demand the right to see the wound and take pictures because you're documenting what is there. And a picture paints a thousand words, much more than a, a description on a page. Mm -hmm. My penalties and fines, we don't see a whole lot of those. Um, is, is the downside of too many penalties and too many fines may put some of these nursing homes on the bubble. And the complaint is, as bad as some of them are, we lose some of these. Elderly care may be in peril. Your thoughts? 
I mean, I, I haven't seen any evidence of that. From what I've seen, if there's a, a nursing home, the rare nursing home that does have issues, that they are going to be cited and they are going to be fined. I mean, I, I haven't seen any sort of reluctance or hesitance from the Department of Health to, to issue deficiencies or fines when there's something out there. Well, with the baby boomers uh, getting older, and I think by 2050, half of our population will be over 65, uh, these cases will not abate anytime soon. What's it going to take to make these cases atrophy for them to go down? You know, from our perspective, we've seen the data out there is that there are fewer facility acquired pressure ulcers now than there were 10 years ago. Yet conversely, there's more nursing home cases than there were 10 years ago. So I don't think it's necessarily a care issue that's driving all the lawsuits in this area. I think there's something else out there that's driving a lot of it. Okay. Well, 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 it I, wouldn't I, be attorney advertising, would it, Mike? <laughs> I just occasionally I read between the lines. So go ahead. But well, I think I'll say it for you. But go ahead. The research does show that there has been a decrease in the number of pressure ulcers. The prevalence rates are down. The incident rates are down. But I think the improved care has been as a result of increased litigation, because. The, fi the settlements are like the fines, and they've taken the place of the fines that should have been dished out by the Department of Health that haven't been under recent administrations. And Ingram, we'll give you last words tonight, peer into the crystal ball for us. What's next, both in the realm of nursing care and litigation, and how might you get involved in that? Well, I, w I would say that the society needs to wake up and understand not only is half the population going to be over 75, but a great deal of that, of that population is going to have dementia, of the Alzheimer's type and others. And everybody's very afraid of that and worried about it. But we, we need to find ways to care for people in the community. Um, you know, when I, whenever I've taught in nursing schools or students from different health professions, I've said, how many of you have been in a nursing home? How many of you want to die in a nursing home? They've all been in a nursing home. None of them want to die in a nursing home. I think we need to make, make nursing homes more palatable and more home-like um, and, and change the way that we give care in nursing homes, but I also think that we have to become much more focused on community-based care. It's where people want to be, of course it's where we want to be, and it's cheaper. And things like PACE programs that are across the country save my, Medicare and Medicaid money and are, and are a good way to much more quality-filled life to way of, of uh, giving care to our older adults. I want to thank all three of my guests tonight. Chris Culleton, plaintiff's attorney from Swartz Culleton, Ingrid Sidorov with the program director for long-term care at On Point Legal Nurse Consulting in Villanova, PA, and Mike Boudier is a corporate defense counsel with Buchanan Ingersoll. For all of us here at ALJ, thank you for joining us this week. Until next Monday night, case closed. This week's American Law Journal is made possible in part by Law Catalyst, video and film production for the legal profession. Go to lawcatalyst.com. Beatty, Sloan, and DeGenova. Providing consumer protection in injury matters for over 30 years. Blank, Rome. Providing strategic advice for employers in today's workplace. King Spry, serving its Pennsylvania clients in family law, business, personal injury, and school law for over 30 years. And The Legal Intelligencer, an American lawyer media publication and the oldest law journal in the United States.